All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today, um, focusing on how to build the next generation of engineers. Um, so before we uh, jump in and hand it off to our speaker, we're going to go over a few things. Um, but I want to make sure that everybody first can, can everybody see the screen? You can either put your answer in the questions or the chat box. Mm. Well, it looks like um, most of you guys can see the screen, so that's a good sign. Um, alrighty then, so we'll move on to the next. So for those of you who haven't attended our uh, webinars before, uh, this is, a, this is a, a webinar hosted by uh, Paige and Paxton. And what our line of resources do is expose children six and under to big concepts in science, technology, engineering, and math. And um, the approach that we take uh, to early childhood STEM is really focusing on getting kids um, engaged and aware of the opportunities and resources and um, just the learning opportunities available to STEM in STEM all around them. Um, and our webinar series is really focused on um, helping early childhood educators and early elementary educators gain access to um, practitioners and, and thought leaders who are, are actually driving um, STEM solutions at the very early um, levels of education. And we're really excited about the topic of engineering today because um, actually February is a, is a big month for engineering. Um, we also have, uh, and we also have a release of a new character in the Page and Paxton series named Penelope. Um, she's uh, actually, we're actually releasing her um, story on Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day, which is tomorrow. And um, similar to Paige and Paxton, uh, Penelope uh, loves engineering and is a way to show young children um, how a lot of the things around them and the things that they love can um, connect them to the field of engineering. And so um, our speaker today uh, found, it, found his perfect fit in engineering, and he actually is uh, dedicated to focusing on helping uh, children uh, you kind of like um, cross-functionally use their brain, which is one of the things that is a, is a key aspect of being successful in STEM and engineering in general. Um, and I, will, I won't take up too much more time because Desmond's going to go a little bit more into his background and how he came um, to focus on math and engineering education. Um, and also some of his uh, approaches to how we can enhance engineering education at the earliest levels without, um, you know, um, investing a lot of money and fancy equipment and resources, but just really utilizing the tools and the, the resources and the people that children um, interact with every day in order to achieve that goal. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to pass the, the, um, the mic over to Desmond and he can take it from here. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, good morning to everyone who's tuning in for this webinar. I'd uh, first like to say thanks so much to uh, Kelly and everyone working over there at Page and Paxton for this awesome opportunity. Um, and yeah, just really want to dig in today into this subject and this idea of opening up engineering opportunities to our youngest members, our youngest students. So. Um, like she said, I am by training an engineer. I have my bachelor's in science in mechanical engineering from the University of Michigan. And um, I actually took a kind of non-traditional route to where I am now. Um, was involved actually in ministry in Ann Arbor and here in Michigan and Detroit. And really felt a call and a passion that it was singularly important to 
open up educational opportunities not only in fields that we think of as traditional fields of learning but also in expanded fields of engineering and technology and really recognized a lack of service for students at the very very youngest levels. Um, I think that the idea of being a doctor or being a scientist or being the president or being a civil servant, a police officer, a soldier, a firefighter, all these things are things that students at a very young age have an understanding and a concept of. But if you ask a child who's in kindergarten or even before kindergarten, hey, do you want to be an engineer? There's really not a widespread concept of what that might mean. And part of that is a lack of access to the opportunities to see what it means to actually be an engineer, what an engineer actually means and what kind of impact engineers and engineering has on our society, on our workforce, on our education, on academia. So um, that's really what we want to talk about. Um, I've been the sole proprietor of Martin's Tutoring Service, serving um, the Metro Detroit area, and the focus is particularly on mathematical tutoring and supplementation. And today we want to talk about how a culture of supplementation focusing specifically on tutoring but branching out into the idea of a culture where we take the disciplines that we learn and apply them in a more cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary way from a young age can really start to open some of these doors for our younger students. So the first thing that we want to talk about is what engineering actually is. When you look up the word engineering, it's derived from the Latin word ingenium, meaning cleverness, and ingenare, meaning to contrive or to devise. So what we talk about really with engineering is the process of being clever, to take our different skill sets, to take different modalities, to take different ways of thinking and apply them positively and intentionally to solving problems. And the amazing thing that we see about our youngest human beings, our youngest learners, our youngest, our youngest students, is that they do this already in a very intuitive way. If you've ever seen a child who has a uh, ever had to get a snack or a cookie or a candy from a high counter and is not able to reach it, you'll see them engage in all kinds of very ingenious ways, all kinds of clever ways to try to figure out how to get what they want. So there, what we really want to do is to hone and nurture that already innate desire to solve problems, to be clever and to see what kind of impact that that has on our education and on our societal outcomes going forward. So, engineering as an educational supplement and investment in outcomes. What we really want to do is we want to think about understanding the differences in investments and outcomes. We want to think about an intentionality in changing the culture and we also want to take a look and think to ourselves, okay, what do societies that have internalized systems of supplementation, of tutoring, look like in terms of their educational outcomes? And particularly when we think about those outcomes as it relates to STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. So here we have a slide in China, and this is a story that was published actually yesterday that talks about educational and investment outcomes. Since 1998, the percentage of GDP dedicated to the education in China has nearly tripled. And in line with that, we think about some of the products that we use even now, some of us may be tuning in on smartphones. No less than 2,000 workers are involved in the production of the first iPhone overseen by 8,700 Chinese industrial engineers. 8,700 
industrial engineers, and they were recruited in only two weeks. Now, in the United States, to recruit that kind of engineering talent to produce a similar product would have taken over nine months. We see a direct correlation, a direct timeline connection to how China invested in 1998 towards this idea of broadening their educational scope and horizon and the outcomes that we see now in a flexibility and mobility and in, in a sheer number of engineering talent that lets, allows products to come to market very quickly. But of course, we don't only want to focus on the idea of making things of being product managers, but also applying these solutions to all forms of societal problems. That's the goal of engineering, is really solving human problems. So it's incumbent upon us now to really connect the dots. And when we connect the dots, we have to think about what we've tried thus far and what we know about education and supplementation to young students, our kindergartners and our pre-K students. When you think about pre-K traditionally, we're thinking about Head Starts. We're thinking about Head Start program and we're thinking about preschool programs. Preschool programs have existed in a formalized way in this country since the early 1920s. Head Start was founded in 1956, I believe, and um, the real goal was getting students kindergarten ready, but really focusing on students that are in an at-risk situation. So when we think about that, we're thinking about really the fundamentals, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Those really basic things that will be expanded upon, but we want to make sure that there are opportunities early on in development to have a formalized approach to our education, be, albeit in a more segmented way. And when we think about non-U.S. models, specifically in developing economies, we're thinking about situations where ec the economic realities of living in more agrarian or more manufacturer-based economies allows or does not allow the economic op opportunity to invest in, in, in education at an early age. So we really don't see children into, into formalized school situations until what we would think of as their kindergarten years, five to six years old. We often see situations where income, incomes and household structures based upon economic as well as cultural situations are centered around sole breadwinners. So we'll have a situation where we see one parent is going out and working, another parent is tasked with really taking care of the home situation, taking care of the living situation, there becomes this dichotomy of the way that we parse out work and social life. And we see occupations that allow for one parent to work while the other parent has to really bear the brunt of child care during the day as well as whatever work might be available to them to help supplement income. And we have even some situations where we see our youngest students who would be kindergarten, pre-K age, also participate or be present doing that work. But as we see a progressive outreach in technology, a more invested focus into making education and access an accessible um, tool, for more and more human beings, not only in this country, but all over the world, we see some disruptive models that have now come into effect. And some of those are really familiar with us. And we have an idea of some things that work versus some things that don't work. Sal Khan has become very, very famous for this vision that he has of the One World Schoolhouse and the work that he's done through the Khan Academy. And the whole vision there is to make education accessible. If you have an internet connection that can support YouTube, you have the ability to receive some kind of instruction. So if you've got a device to play, if you've got a way to connect, and you have the content available to you, there's an opportunity for you to really dig into content and really get some instruction that you might not have able been, been able to get. And that's been disruptive 
on another on a number of levels um, in conjunction with what we see in terms of the build out of internet architecture and infrastructure. Um, and then we have to think about some destruct disruptive models that haven't worked. If we think about Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook's hundred million dollar donation to the Newark public school system and an attempt to really reform public schools in that particular area, um, while it was well intentioned, while it was deliberate, while it was intentional, while it was an honest undertaking and, and motivated by what I believe to be the most upright of ideals, the fact of the matter is that all measures of improvement in New York public schools since the program started have shown very little to any change. And some things that we can point to as the reason for that lack of change, we can really think about as being addressed in the way that we communicate, in the way that we build culture. So the real truth here is that it's not about more technologies, teachers, or student time in classrooms. It's about whether or not a child has a foot in the door from the beginning. Whether or not there's a paradigm that at the most basic level says learning about this particular field of academics, this interdisciplinary, highly flexible field of engineering, is something that's available to you at a very, very early age. Are we encouraging you that taking information from all the different subjects that you learn and apply it to solve problems is something that you can do as a living, touching all forms of human life? And that's what's really, really missing. So then we think about what would that look like? What does that look like in the day of a life of our students, in the day of a life of our teachers, and in, in the day of a life of our supplementers, our tutors, of our parents, of our resources? How does that translate? And what we really talk about is going from classroom seat time to what I like to think of as table time. So usually we are dealing, when we think about pre-K education, we're usually dealing with what we think of as rote learning. We're learning the basics. We're learning grammar. We're learning alphabets. We're learning counting. We're learning basic addition and subtraction in terms of arithmetic. And to do that, we learn that through repetition. We're shown what to do. We're given chances to practice. We go over and over again in problem sets. And then we are evaluated as to whether or not we can take these sectioned off areas of our learning and really apply them. Instead, what if our children came home from school not with problem sets and not with necessarily workbooks and not with large, well not necessarily large, but lengthy amounts of papers that are returned to different teachers evaluating different aspects of their learning, but instead came home each night with a problem that was interdisciplinary. What if they had to learn what they learned about counting, learn what they learned about basic addition and subtraction? learned, take what they learned about very basic geography, and then come in at home and work in a learning scenario in which they're applying what they already do, which is to take knowledge from all over the place and to solve a problem with it. And what if we did that, not as a special project or something that's tacked on to the end of a problem set, but in an intentional and organized way that encouraged our students to look for solutions in unexpected ways. That's the paradigm shift that I think as a supplementer, a supplementer that we really want to see change and that we really want to see going forward. So an example of that is merging skill sets. Skill sets that we think about kindergartners and pre-K are counting and being able to recognize the alphabet. 
what we usually do separately is we'll give them, like I was saying before, problem sets. Do problems, 10, 20, 5, however many may be appropriate for the student or is mandated by um, the actual curriculum. And then um, we'll have them do that for their math class. But then we have them in um, language arts class, and they're practicing writing letters and words and vocabulary. And that's a separate sheet of paper usually that has to be returned and will be evaluated. So instead, we'll combine the activity. We'll create an activity in which we'll have to fill in the letters and count how many letters that we filled in. So it sounds really basic, but what we've done is we've combined two of their skill sets that they were previously working on into one activity. And it may be so slight that they may not even realize it, but they're actually accessing two different skill sets at one time, where they're counting and they're also working on their alphabet skills. The problem that has to be solved is that we have blanks. We have spaces that need to be filled in in terms of this project that I'm working on, but I know that I have to pull from two different areas. And that's a really simple ex ex explanation, but that can be scaled and that can be built out on the different learning modalities that we apply to our kindergarten and pre-K students. So another example, skill sets that we also really focus on are pattern recognition and a building of a base of vocabulary. Those two things are extremely important. When we talk about the next level of, of math and arithmetic into kindergarten and first grade and second grade, pattern recognition and addition and subtraction becomes important in a very paramount way. We're not only building out their mathematical knowledge and understanding of place value, but we're also understanding how those numbers will interact in each other with each other in a real way and how applying arithmetic is something that's a foundation for what we do. And then we talk about vocabulary. That's a critical part of a child's cognitive developmental process, the ability to associate language with the symbols that is our writing, whatever language we speak particularly. And then we have things that we do separately to that. Jigsaw puzzles, when you talk about spatial recognition and pattern recognition in those, in those puzzles, helps to train and hone those skills and towards pattern recognitions. And then when we do vocabulary, we construct words. We have our base words. We have our prefixes and suffixes. We have um, the simple act of associating words with objects. We create that object association with our vocabulary. And then we go forward and we may even produce a deeper sense of definition of context with these words. And these are things that we usually do se separately when we think about a context of, um, of traditional pre-K education in a head start or, or a preschool. But once again, we can combine these learning modalities. And this, not by coincidence, comes in the line, once again, of really solving another, another puzzle. We'll have letters associated with puzzle pieces, and when we solve our puzzle pieces, we're also constructing these letters together to form words. So it becomes a multi-step process where we use object and spatial association to now build a pathway to word and object association. We're able to diversify our learning modalities. We're able to foster and create curiosity. We build in a reward system where by completing one section of the process, where it opened up to another section of the process. And that really um, builds in a more deeply enriching and engaging way for our students to learn. And it continues to foster their creativity and their cleverness. So what we really want to do is we want to hear from you all when we think about making this community stick. Referring back to um, the difference between what Sal Khan has done with the One World Treehouse, the One World Schoolhouse, I'm sorry, and um, the difference in what Facebook and Zuckerberg and Mayor Booker did in Newark, we think about 
the differences in understanding and interweaving this idea of supplementation and exposure and at the earliest levels. When we think about what took place in Newark, what was really missing, what really was not there, what really was not understood, is how the culture of education previously existed and was not working in such a way that our students will be open to these opportunities to be clever. We didn't have a good understanding of what their barriers were. We didn't have a good understanding of how supplementers might have already been working in the situation. And when we think about supplementation, we think about some of the goals that we want to see from school reform in a general sense. When you talk about a tutor, you have the opportunity in many cases where you have one-on-one -on -one attention or you have student-to-classroom ratio sizes that are extremely small. You have flexibility because you're not tied down to a regular workday schedule in a lot of situations. You have the opportunity, once again, to um, really build up a level of personal accountability between a student and a parent and a tutor. You have the opportunity for a tutor to go in and really interface and dialogue with a teacher where the teacher and tutor are working in a partnership where if there's a different learning style or modality that a teacher is enabled to provide for a student that a tutor may provide on the other end or where a tutor will understand the school system or a particular school and be able to effectively take multiple modalities, multiple places of learning and assimilate them into ways that challenge and force our students to learn in different ways. So these are just a few examples, but we really want to know from you as professionals, as thought leaders, as educators, what are the ways that we can think about changing supplementation that will stick with our students, we'll stick with our teachers, we'll stick with our parents. And, and really at the, at the most basic level, when we think about engineering, we think about, um, we think about being clever, we're talking about improvisation. Mm -hmm. So we want to know, and we want to hear from you, describe the ways in that we see our young students improvise. Because the thing about improvisation is that it's not specifically going up there and being good. No one's naturally good at improvisation. When you improvise, you get asked the question and you answer yes to that question and you add the and. So it's not just yes, it's yes and. Okay. So we have a, um, a example from um, Rhonda Atkins. She said a student wanted to play with a puppet but didn't have enough, um, so he went to the cubby and put on a glove and pretended he had a puppet. That's a beautiful example. Thank you so much, Rhonda. We see a student that made an object association that said, here I have of these puppets, these facsimiles, and I'm trying to create. I'm trying to create a scenario, whatever that scenario might be with these puppets, but they saw a lack and said, hey, what can stand in as a facsimile for what I'm doing? I have enough of an imagination here that I can see a glove and not just see this glove as something that goes in my hand, but something that can actually actually participate in this world. We see this repurposing. We see a, a use of efficiency. And even in this play, we already see these really in, in amazing skills that come forward that, um, that will be... Um, echoed in what engineers do in their daily lives. So that same student that sees a glove and sees a potential uh, participant in their play is the same kind of engineer that we think of on the Apollo mission where there's a malfunction. They say, hey, what spare parts do we have lying around up there that we can turn into a solution? That's the same kind of thinking. So also in line with observing our students improvise, we want to think about how we can intentionally place young students in scenarios in which they need to improvise. And this really involves uh, a deep shift in our paradigm thinking. We used to think about that as, if we think about traditional problem sets, 
um, there may be one or two tacked on usually at the end that require critical things. And that's the one where we're given scenarios. So instead of having the rote work be the bulk, let's turn the work into scenarios. Let's turn the work into one that gives a benefit because we're trying to intentionally solve a problem. And we're doing that and we're asking our students, hey, what kind of ways, use your imagination, there's no wrong way to do this, come up with an answer to the solution. And we talked a, about a few of them earlier, so some of the examples in terms of taking these different modalities and involving them in what we would do in terms of after-school supplementation. So another example of that um, are in our science classes, starting usually around the third or fourth grade, we have this idea of doing lab work, where we will actually test concepts. And um, the labs, the concept of the lab in and of itself is interdisciplinary. You have to apply your skills in recording what you've learned about in um, language arts, in reading, and being artic articulate yourself through language. You'll have to apply concepts through mathematics and measurement, how to actively and accurately measure and take count of and quantify whatever data that you're looking at. And then you also have to apply these ideas from that are really being focused on in terms of the lab, in terms of the physical characteristics or property of our world that are being studied as well. So in and of that self, it becomes really inter interdisciplinary. But I believe that even at a young level, we can do some things that really touch those points where we're drawing in their different modalities of learning in their different subject areas as well. And we really want to hear from you on that. We want to know whether those different ways that we can put our students in intentionally contrived and derived situations where they'll have to be clever and show their improvisational skills and creativity to solve problems. Okay. Um, so we have a, uh, an example from Dolores, um, Mr. Uh, so you can give a design challenge and purposely leave out certain materials in which students will be forced to improvise to get the design challenge completed. That's a great example. That is a perfect example. In that challenge, we already see things that, once again, really are typified in our idea of engineering having the design challenge but knowing that there is a constraint, a constraint in terms of a lack of resource, a constraint in terms of a lack of time, a constraint in terms of a lack of understanding of a physical space or even a mathematical co computation to um, fulfill the requirements of the design challenge. So um, actually having to go hands in and our students having to put and be intimately engaged with having a three think through a process and implement a solution is really key in building up this idea of, okay, I learned what I needed to learn in school about this concept, and now I can really apply it in a meaningful way outside of school to really build this sense of everything working together. So we really want to expand our educational community and what we think about in terms when we think when we think about what an educational community is. Oftentimes we think about our school administrators, we think about our um, actual teachers and professors, all of them highly trained and skilled education professionals. We think about school staff that will impact and really set the tone for the for the environment in which our, our students will learn and for a vast majority of their day. Um, but we also want to think about the community impacts outside of their school once they leave school and go home. 
how are their extracurricular activities um, tying into what they learn and really drawing out in an interdisciplinary way what they learn. When they participate in social organizations, how are they being cast and asked to pull from an interdisciplinary way to be a positive, um, positive contributor to that space? When we think about if they even have a, a spiritual tradition in which they incorporate it in, and if that spiritual tradition values education as a part of the spiritual growth, how do we think about that? Um, and what are the different ways that we can dialogue as a community? So how does the parent's input into what the teacher does or the teacher's input into what their tutor does or the administrator's input into what the tutor does and how can we foster that interplay of ideas to find the best practices and the best outcomes? It's all about building a partnership around opening the doors. And we see education reformers, we see teachers, we see tutors, we see administrators, people from all aspects of life who are engaged in that, but we want to see that in a more intentional way. Um, we want to expand the modalities in these different situations in which they learn. So if you leave school and you are never expected to do any math work, outside of school, then you're not really going to be expected to excel in math. We want to have an expectation that we're going to have to apply our learning in more than a schoolwork situation. Um, we want to foster learning in environments that requires for our, our students to be clever. Things being hard and having requiring um, puzzle solving techniques is, is a good thing for our young students and it's something that we want to learn how to encourage them and to really let them know that this is a part of, of a life work, of expanding our education, of applying our vocations, and to really changing our world in positive ways. Our children have math homework and reading homework, but they really don't have ways of integrating those different things and flexing their, the wholeness of their educational muscle. So if we think about what we're learning in our different areas of learning as different subjects, then we are learning how to do bicep curls or we're learning how to do squats, but we're not learning how to move our whole body together. So we really want to force our students to move their minds together. And I think that in doing that, we'll start to see them express things and really pour out in ways that are just incredible. And we'll see that being measured in test scores and grades and we'll also see that reflected in the way that we push reform, especially in an age that requires us to change from a making economy to a thought economy. So if we take nothing else from this talk and this time we spent, we really, from the perspective of a supplementer, want to act, open up access and opportunities for our students before we think about investing into more technology and resources. Having an iPad or a computer is great, but if I don't have the concept and the base work that I'm using this to solve more complex puzzles, it really doesn't do us a lot of good. Um, if students, even at a really, really, really young age, kindergarten and pre-k to understand that there are real options for them for STEM careers then they won't take those options later on. As I referenced early, earlier we have to hear that I want to be an astronaut or I want to be a scientist or I want to be a doctor or and we and one of those words that we want to hear is I want to be an engineer and have that be a tangible and attainable goal for our students and say, hey, there is a path and a learning modality that we'll make available for you that we get there. And that just really is accompanied by a shift in our paradigm and a shift in the way that we think about engineering within our culture. And then thirdly, we want to intentionally in create environments for our students to really build upon the key fundamental skills 
for engineers, which is integrating and utilizing the different disciplines that they learn. The more time that they take having to synthesize and being creative what they learn in school, the more and more they've got the very basic foundation of what it means to be an engineer going forward. And we will really see transformative changes in the ways that our students will learn and grow and also and the outcomes that that means for them later on. We will see our next generation of students completely revolutionize not only their various fields of study, but also the way that we study and learn going into the future. So uh, at this time, we're going to open it up. I think uh, Kelly's going to open it up for a Q&A session. Yep. All right, uh, so if you have any questions, please um, just submit them into the question box and we'll and we'll queue them up for uh, Desmond. So we um, have our first question. Uh, I've heard from uh, soft that soft skills such as teamwork are important in STEM. How early should we place students in situations where collaboration or working together? to solve a problem is beneficial? That's an excellent question. Um, as early as possible. Um, it's amazing that once again, when we think about cleverness and really pulling from our knowledge base to solve complex problems is something that we do from an intuitive perspective, so is our idea of relating to those around us. And the core ability to communicate our ideas, to communicate our restraints, to find our perfect places, our perfect fits into the ways that we can help solve these problems is something that we do from a early age in an intuitive way as well. So intentionality and having projects where we have one participant or having a project where we have two or in having some other projects where we may have even three or more is key not only in social development but also with this idea that I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to have all the answers to change the world. I can be more than adequate, excellent, and contribute to a process that gives even more excellent solutions. Hmm. Good way of uh, thinking about that. Um, so we have another question uh, asking uh, Desmond directly. Uh, what project are you working on that you referred to earlier on? Uh, so, specifically, and um, I've had a chance to do this in some different teaching scenarios, is um, where through integrating what a particular client or a particular student has from school, um, I'm thinking of a high school student who recently was studying civics and um, was also studying biology at the same time. So a way that we that I supplemented with her in her education is to find the intersectionality and make her think about both. I had her write a paper. I had her write a paper where she had to argue for or against a, a particular subject pertaining to DNA um, evidence. So the rubric for the paper was one in which she was um, a legislator and she was presented with a bill that would dramatically expand the number of persons in the DNA database and she had to support her position with scientific fact. So in that situation she has to utilize both what she knows about what it means to participate in the legislative process and being a legislator have to understand the political ramifications of what she's what she's proposing, the position that she's taking, understand the constitutional um, ramifications, but also have to understand the science, something that a lot of our legislators aren't able to do from a cross-disciplinary platform. And then she has to now be able to synthesize both of these modalities and learning of her teacher, of her teaching and um, apply them in a coherent way in this paper. So that's, that's just an example. It varies from grade level, um, but it's, it's 
the really heart of this is to say, okay, I understand that what is being taught here has applications in other ways. Okay, let's make this real. Instead of having it abstract, let's bring it into a situation that actually will reflect an actual problem. Mm -hmm. Are there any other uh, questions? All right. Uh, can problem solving activities be more simple, such as reading a story and asking students to think of alternative endings? Yes, absolutely. They can be more simple. This something as simple as that is um, is great because it at really activates their ability to see more than one outcome. To know that what's on the page, what's written, is not only in the mind of the author, but in the mind for their own interpretation as well. So I would um, go even further, and this, this admittedly wouldn't make the activity more simple, but um, you could leave sections of a story open for interpretation. So there are sections of the story that are defined. There are sections of the story that may be defined for our student, and they can really create and fill in in their minds what they think that, that should happen and what those outcomes will be. But that's a that's a great example because it's, it really forces our students to not only know that there are possible different possible outcomes and they mean different things, but there are also different ways to get to our different outcomes, which is a part of the creation process. All right, are there any more questions? All right, so if you guys don't have any other questions at this time, or if you may have some um, different questions that you would like to ask uh, Desmond offline, um, his email address is deskmartin at gmail.com. So you can also reach out to him directly if you want to run any um, ideas or if you have any specific questions um, or um, advice or just insight that you would like him to give on, you know, some things that you are thinking about doing in your classroom or your school system. And so what's next? So again, um, like I mentioned before, if you have additional questions, you can contact our guest speaker directly at deskmartin at gmail.com. Um, Want to make sure that if you are um, would like to get credit um, and receive a certificate for a PD uh, credit hours, please email me at kelly at honeybco.com and we will send you a certificate via email that you can um, apply for your professional development credit hours. Um, if you and then if you have um, if you want to reference the the webinar later or if you have any colleagues who may have missed out on the webinar, um, we will have the webinar transcripts and recording available by next Wednesday. And we will also send that out via email um, as a reminder. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Desmond, for joining us today. Um, I think this is very insightful way to show how. Um, you know, early STEM, early engineering education, like we say, isn't necessarily rocket science, but just really tapping into the skills that uh, students are already developing and really helping them um, hone in and on those and, you know, use them cross-functionally. Uh, so thank you again, Desmond. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was certainly my pleasure. And I'm wishing all the best for all of our teachers and all of our educators as they continue going forward and um, really transforming our early engineering education. All right. Thank you.